So Sayyidina, what was the madhab of the Shaykh? This is the next question. Was he a Wahhabi? You always find it, this guy's a Wahhabi. He doesn't celebrate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he must be a Wahhabi. Right. So we'll discuss first the mother of the shaykh and then we'll discuss where this word al wahhabiyya came from. In brief. The mother of the shaykh or the aqeedah of the shaykh was the aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And the aqeedah of the shaykh or the mother of the shaykh was the mother of the Salaf al Salah. Meaning, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab did not come with anything new. Sheikh did not come with anything new. There is no such thing as al Wahhabiyyah. There is no such thing as Wahhabiyyah. Wahhabiyyah is a delusion. What is it? A delusion. It doesn't exist. I don't know no Wahhabi. I know of Muslims and I know of those who are Sufis. So Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab was a Sunni. What was he? Sunni. A true Sunni. Not the fake Sunnis. No, we have the fake Sunnis, we have the true Sunnis. He was a true Sunni. And what is a true Sunni? A true Sunni is somebody who follows the Sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, does not advocate good bidah. You ask the guy, what are you? He says, I'm a Sunni. But, yeah, but we do good bidah. There's good bidah. So, you call yourself a Sunni, and you don't follow the Sunnah. And you say there's a good bidah, and you follow all the good bidahs, but then you say you're Sunni. No shame. A true Sunni is the one who follows Allah. So al Wahhabiyyah, this term was actually introduced by the British. Great Britain. Hmm? Queen Elizabeth. It was introduced by who? The British. It was introduced by the British when the British saw that the Puritan Muslims in the Indian subcontinent follow the Quran and the Sunnah and they exactly follow what a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab was following. They decided to introduce this new term known as Wahhabi. They said to the Muslim law, anybody who doesn't believe in going to the graves, anybody who doesn't believe in, in celebrating death anniversaries, so this term was introduced by who? Great Britain. <coughs> the Salaf of Theresa May. The Salaf of who? Theresa May. The Salaf of Theresa May are the one who introduced this term, Al-Wahhabi, or Wahhabi. Like I said to you, Wahhabi is a delusion. That's why we say that we challenge these people who call us Wahhabis, that look at the books of Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad al-Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala. This is his book with his handwriting. Show us something from his book which you don't find in the Kitab and the Sunnah. Show us something in his book that is different from the Salaf al -Sahab. Challenge is open for anyone. Bring us from his books. From his <coughs> books. Show us something which he believes that the Sahaba did not know. So, the term al Wahhabiyyah is British. In the time of Queen Elizabeth, and it was introduced by the Salaf of Theresa May. So, this is with regard. So, in fiqh, Shaykh al Islam was al -Hambali. In fiqh, he followed which fiqh? Al Hambali Shaykh al Islam Muhammad al Wahhab himself says, and he said that I am upon the Hanbali Madhab, but when I find the Hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then I leave the Madhab and I follow the Hadith of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that means that he was not a blind follower, a muqallid of the Hanbali Madhab. And that if the Madhab contradicted the Sunnah, then he would abandon the Madhab and follow the Sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam based upon the general statement إِذَا صَحَّ الْحَدِيثُ فَهُوَ مَلْحَبِينَ إِذَا صَحَّ الْحَدِيثُ فَهُوَ مَلْحَبِينَ So that was his madhab. What was his madhab? Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab is a Sunni. What is he? 
a Sunni. A Sunni Muslim who was upon the mother of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. The next question is who are his teachers? Man hum ashkur shiofi. Who are his most famous teachers? He had a lot of teachers, but there are certain teachers that Sheikh al Islam was highly influenced with. Uh, who knows his teachers? One of them I've already mentioned. Who did he study with? His father. His father. So that shows that the crowd is not sleeping there. Oh, wait. Because we'll have to bring the water. So from amongst his teacher was his father, a sheikh of the Wahhab. From amongst his teacher was the Indian sheikh, Al Allama Muhammad Hayat. Al-Sindhi, Al-Madhi, Indian chef. Chef al-Islam was highly influenced by this chef, the Indian chef. When he came to Medina, the chef had a seat and would teach hadith. He was the Muslim of Madin, the highest authority in hadith in Madin. Chef al-Islam studied with him. And Chef al-Islam told him about his vision and his da'wah that he wanted to do. And Muhammad Hayat Sindhi encouraged him. He was highly influenced by Shaykh al-Islam. One of the other sheikhs that he studied with was a sheikh Ismail al-Ajlul. Another sheikh, a sheikh Ali Afnadi al-Dabistan. <coughs> Sheikh Ali al Dagestan. So these are some of the sheikhs of Sheikh Al Islam Muhammad al Muhammad. What do we understand from this? We understand from this that a person who decides to give da'wah, he must have teachers. He must learn his knowledge from who? Not from just books, but from scholars. So when you find somebody who has no teachers and no scholars that he has studied with, and even those scholars that he studies with, must be the scholars of the Sunnah, not the scholars of Bidah. He must have, he must study with the scholars of the Sunnah. If you don't have scholars of the Sunnah, then you don't take, if that person does not have teachers, then you don't take knowledge from him. Why? Because he's not somebody who has seek knowledge from the right people. Because if we were to able to study everything from the books, then there would not be need, then, then, then there would be no need of teachers. <coughs> there would be no need of shiu. <coughs> the next question is why is there always a fuss about Muhammad Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's da'a? What was his da'wah? What was his call? Why did his da'wah have an impact upon the whole Muslim world? When, which year was he born in? Uh -huh. No one there, Rabbul Haq. 1115. Remind me of you next week, inshallah. We'll bring you a suite, inshallah. Next week, yeah? 1115, inshallah. Remind me. The Shaykh of Islam was born in 1000, after 1115, after Hijrah. 1115 after Hijrah, 1703 <coughs> according to the English calendar. So in 300 years we saw that Shaykh al-Islam's da'wah still has an impact. So what was this da'wah that he called? <coughs> was this a new da'wah? Or was it an old da'wah? Was it something different? When we look at the da'wah of Shaykh al-Islam, we find that his da'wah started with the call of Tawheed. <coughs> with the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Ubudi. So his da'wah, the da'wah of Muhammad, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, was divided into two parts. How many parts? The first part of his da'wah was to call to the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we talk about Tawheed, we mean but Tawheed al And the second part of his da'wah was 
to eradicate shirk and bidr. So the first part of his da'wah was to establish a tawheed and the second part of his da'wah was to eradicate shirk and So this is what his da'wah was. Now, was huh? he Bida. Innovation in the deen. Introducing something new into the religion. <laughs> so now, Shaykh al Islam, the next question is that where did Shaykh al Islam, Muhammad al Wahab, rahimahullah ta'ala, start giving his da'wah? Next question is, we know what his da'wah was, now we want to know where he started his da'wah. So we know that there's three famous places in the Muslim world. The place where he is from, this is known as Najd. Makkah and Medina, which is the center of Islam. And al Basra, where he traveled. <coughs> So where did Shaykh al-Islam start his da'wah? Did he go first to Makkah and Medina? Did he start his da'wah in Najd? Or did he go to Basra? They said that he started some of his da'wah in, in, in Najd, but the first place where he started his da'wah, he started to preach, was Basra. So he decided. So now Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad al He's traveled around the Muslim world, he studied with the Shiyukh, and now he wants to give down. So now he decides, he decides that he's going to go to Basra. Where is he going to go? To Iraq. So he decided to go to Iraq. And where did he decide to go in Iraq? Basra. as they say, huh? Basra. Basra. So what happened in Basra? Did the people accept his da'wah? So what was his da'wah? His da'wah was <coughs> to call people to Tawheed and warn them against Shirk and Bidah. And a lot of the Muslims during the time of Shaykh al-Islam were indulged in Shirk and Bidah. They thought that Shirk and Bidah is what Muhammad Rasulullah did. So Shaykh al-Islam wanted to change this. He said, we must bring the people back to the original da'wah to the original deen of Muhammad Rasulullah, which is Tawheed, <coughs> and warning against shit, acting upon the Sunnah, and warning against him. So he went to Basra. <coughs> so what happened in Basra? Did the people of Basra accept his da'wah? No, they didn't. What did they do? They chased him away. What did they do? They chased him away and they tried to kill him. To the extent that Shaykh al-Islam had to run during the day. At midday. So he's giving that one in Basra. He's telling the people that stop doing shit. Stop doing shit. Make ibadah of Allah alone. Only ask from Allah. You don't need to ask from anybody else. So they came for him and they wanted to kill him. And this was, he was giving them da'wah during the day, midday, scorching heat. You can imagine midday in Iraq and in Hijaz, you can fry an egg on the bonnet of a car. Trust me, we've tried it, yeah? In Madeira. When it's 45, 46, 47, trust me, you put a bit of oil and you put it on the bonnet and you put an egg, you can fry an egg. Well done. Yeah. By Sunday breakfast, well done, it's also awesome. So in the scorching heat, on midday, they chased him out to kill him. He had no shoes. Barefooted, he ran. He ran away towards this desert to the extent that he was dying of thirst and he was about to die. You believe? Shaykh al-Islam is now about to 
his body like he fought barefoot in scorching heat. What happens next? He's about to he's in the scorching heat, he's got no shoes, he's about to die. All of a sudden, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent somebody to his rescue. A man came, Abba Humaida, from a place called Az-Zubair, in Iraq. He carried Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Abdul Wahab is, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab is almost dead. He carried him on his donkey. And he gave him water and quenched his thirst and saved him. The Shaykh of Islam was just about to die. They said, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab thought, khalas, that was it. He's dead now. He's run away, the people tried to kill him. He's about dying of thirst. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the awliya of Allah, the friends of Allah, Allah protects them. So who was this person? Abba Humaydah. What was his name? Abba Humaydah came from a place called Az-Zubair. Came from a place called a Zubair. He carried him, put him on his donkey, gave him water, quenched his thirst. And Shaykh al-Islam was saved. So then what happened next? The next question. So after he escaped from this catastrophe, which almost killed him, and this shows that when a person gives da'wah, when a person gives da'wah, he doesn't fail anybody except who? Except, except who? We have some of these massages, you know, they say, don't come and talk about controversial issues. Why? Because the other people are going to come and break the windows of our masjid. We'll have to get them repaired. It's going to cost us 400 pounds. Some of these massages, they say this. You speak the Haq, you speak the truth. Now, you speak the Haq and the truth with Hikmah. You don't incite hatred. You don't incite fitna. You don't incite controversy. You need Hikmah in what you do. But at the same time, you don't negotiate and become flexible that you don't convey the truth and you remain silent. So there's two extremes. The middle path is wasadiyya, is to convey the truth with Hikmah, Amu'illa bil Hasan. And then have trust in Allah. The windows will not be broken, inshallah. But the message of Tawheed will reach them. This shows that even if the life of a person is taken, <coughs> the truth is not negotiated, and the truth, the truth does not become flexible. So Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad al-Wahhab, after Basra, what happened? He returned back to a place called Hulayna. So he decided now from Basra, he's going to go to a place called, what, what, what is this place called? Hulaymila. Hulaymila. Ha. Abba Humaydan rescued him from Zubair, a place called Zubair. What's the place called? Zubair. Not another person, a place called Zubair. He came back to Hulaymila. What did he find? In Hudaybala he found the same thing. He found people who were doing shit. So he leaves one place, he comes to another place, same problem. So what happens? Did he stay quiet this time? Thinking, no. Last time I almost got killed. Last time I was giving da'wah and they almost punched me. I don't want to get into this, this is too difficult, man. Not my thing. Go home, I'll relax. What did Shepard Islam? Did he say, nah, I don't want to get into this, it's too difficult. <coughs> so he started to give down. And the people of Qurayyimala and him, they started, there was a dispute. Oh, Muhammad Dohab is the fitna maker. Yeah? He's come here to make fitna with us, that's what they said. So when you find the people of truth, when they convey the truth, say, you know, this guy is always causing controversy. Always making fitna. Wherever he goes, there's fitna. 
Ja on si voli izboriti. Da dava, da izboriti. Da dava avtohi. Can you show me in the history of mankind, and I say this openly, and my challenge is to everybody, one person come forward and answer this question, <coughs> that can you show me a prophet or a messenger from the time of Noah alayhi salam to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam that didn't have a dispute with these people. That the people did not fight with them. Show me one, one prophet. Allah, ma'alakum min ilayhi. The da'wah started with controversy. Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi what did he say to the people of Quraysh when he got them? When he said to them, قُولُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ فِحُوهُ Say لَا إِلَهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ You become successful. What will happen? تَبَّتْ يَدَعْيَا مُحَقْتِ As a man of sin. And Allah said, تَبَّتْ يَدَعْيَا SubhanAllah. One thing, just one thing. The man who was the most beloved man in the whole of Makkah became the most hated man in Makkah because of one statement, because of one thought. And when you find the scholars, they are upon the manhaj and the methodology of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, the people of Qurayblah, they said, no, not here. Sorry, not in our masjid. Anywhere else, but not here. We don't like controls. Give dawah anywhere else. He said, here in Qurayblah, we don't want you to talk about this. Shut this up, I have to talk about Qurayblah. I can't stop talking about Tawheed. <laughs> so then, the Sheikh, when he saw these two encounters that happened with the Sheikh, he went to Basra openly, they almost killed him. He came to Haraymila openly, they started making issues for him. The Sheikh said, Khalas, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna stay under the radar for a little while, and just give that one. So the Sheikh continued his da'wah, he didn't stop his da'wah. He said, when we get some people with us, who are strong and influential, with the aid and assistance of Allah first, he said, secondly, then we'll make our da'wah open. So after Basra al Hurayblah, the Sheikh continued giving his da'wah, publicly, just individually. Then the time came that he decided to come back into the, come back into public. Come back into public and give da'wah publicly. So when did this happen? <laughs> this happened openly when he was about 38 years old. But he started to decide to give that up in public. How many years? The next question is how many years did he stay in Borevila? So when the people of Borevila didn't allow him to give that up openly, he went, you can say, off the radio for a while and then he came back to give that up. He stayed 15 years in Borevila giving that up. How many years? So, what happened was in Hurayla. This is what happened in Hurayla. When he came back from Basra, he came to Hurayla. He done his dawa openly. They rejected it. So there was a dispute amongst him. But he stayed in Hurayla for 15 years. He started to give dawa individually, not publicly. He stayed in Hurayla for 15 years and after his father died, that's when he decided that he was going to come home. So what was the first, one of the first books that he wrote? Next question is, what was one of the first books that Sheikh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, one of the first books that he wrote was Kitab al-Tawheed. So the first book that he wrote was 
كتاب التوحيد الذي هو حق الله على العبد كتاب التوحيد was one of the first books of him. We know that he decided to he stayed in Huraymila for how many years? 15 years. So for 15 years he stayed in Huraymila. Did he leave Huraymila and go somewhere else? Yes, he did. From Huraymila he moved back to Al Uyayn. From Al Huraymila, from Huraymila he returned back to Uyayn. Uyayna is what place? What place is this? His hometown. This is where he was born. Why did he move back to Uyayna? He moved back to Uyayna, Al Uyayna, after the people of Huraymila were conspiring to kill him. So they were secretly planning to kill him. This is what the people of Bida do. What do they do? The people of innovation and people of deviation, what do they do? They secretly plot against you. They secretly plot against you. This is the trait of, and the, of the people of Bida and Shir. This is what they do. So he went back to Uyayna. So when he went back to Uyayna, Uyayna is his hometown. That's where his father was. That's where his grandfather was, came from Al Uyayna. When he returned back to Al Uyayna from Huraymila, he destroyed all the graves. All the graves that were elevated and built, he destroyed. He destroyed all the trees. Everything that was worshipped other than Allah, he destroyed. What did he do? He destroyed them. And in his place, in his town, in his village, Al Uyayna, there was a woman that had committed zina. She had fallen. <coughs> so they came to him. They said, You know what about this woman? He said, Simple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to establish the wudu of Allah. Punishment of Allah. The punishment for this crime has been sent by Allah and Allah's message. So he started to implement the sharia. And he said that this woman should be killed. This is what Allah and Allah's message have said in the Quran. <coughs> so she was killed. So when he decided to demolish the graves, to destroy the trees, to establish the Sharia, so what happened after that? The people were rallying against him, protesting against him. The uncivilized hooligans, they decided to come and thugs. They said, you know, we're going to deal with this man. Oh, go up. He's destroyed the graves, demolished the trees, establishing this new law of killing a woman if she's committed zina. And they complained against Muhammad al because he was from that place. Who was the governor, to the governor, of al -Uyayn. And with the governor, Ibn Urayr, Urayr the, the head, the chief governor of al Uyayna, Uthman ibn Ma'ma, commanded that Muhammad Abdul Wahab should be exiled from al -Uyayn. He must be kicked out, can't be so in the year 1158 after Hijra, he was kicked out from his own town. So they conspired against him. And he did all this, the hooligans, the thugs, the went. So Ibn Urayr, and Ibn Urayr told the chief governor of Al Uyayna, rid of this one. What year was it? 1158 after Hijra. What happens now? From Basra, Huraymila, from Huraymila to Al Uyayna, and now he's got kicked out from his own town. Where does he go next? 
So he decides to go to a place called al Dar'iyah. So he, somebody told him, go to a place called al Dar'iyah. What is this place for? al Dar'iyah. Muhammad al-Duha, he goes to al Dar'iyah. And he was a guest at the house of Ahmad ibn Suwaylib al Qarayn. And the Amir of al Dar'iyah, or the leader of al Dar'iyah, was a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Saud. <coughs> from Basra, Huraymina, from Huraymina to Al Uyayna, and from Al Uyayna to Al Dar'iyah. So he's in al and he's a guest at the house of Ahmad ibn Saud. So Muhammad ibn Saud hears about this man. He hears that there's a, there's a, there's a sheikh that's come to al -Dar'i. His name is Muhammad ibn al He's a controversial person. Wherever he goes, there's issues, fitna. So Muhammad ibn Saud, Sheikh al-Islam wanted to meet him. Muhammad ibn Saud was hesitant. Pessimist. He should not meet him. So, I don't want to, I don't want to be linked with this man, you know, I don't want to get into trouble. <coughs> so he heard about this person, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, who destroys graves, who demolishes trees, who wants to establish the Kitab and the Sunnah. So the wife of Muhammad ibn Saud said to him, Allah, I've heard nothing but good about this man. Calls to the deen of Allah. Calls to the Tawheed of Allah. I think that you should at least meet him once. See who just go. There's no harm in meeting Go and see. Go and see. Allah, why do you meet him? If you've heard all these rumors about him, why don't you meet him yourself and see what type of person he is? And this is why I always say that don't judge the people. If you hear something about somebody you don't know him, meet that person yourself to find out the reality of that person. Don't always give your ears and believe everything that you hear about that person. So what happened? Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Saud, he, he thought about this. And his wife, she said to him, Thought, you know, sometimes when your wife tells you something, you know, you listen. You start coming to them. Don't go and shop at Asda because it's expensive to go to Tesla. <laughs> you start thinking. Yeah? So the wife has a big influence. Yeah? In fact, all of this here, all of the Zabai, you know, and the British wife has an extra influence. Even if you don't understand something, you're made to understand something. So a woman has a good influence. If a woman is a pious woman, that's why if you marry a pious woman, her influence will be a neqma for you. And if you marry an impious woman, she will be a neqma for you. So always look for what type of a wife you're going to look for, a pious woman. A wife who will guide you to do that which is good and right. So Sheikh Al Islam, Muhammad Wahab wanted to meet Muhammad ibn Saud, and Muhammad ibn Saud's wife persuaded him. So he said, "Okay, set up a meeting." He said Muhammad ibn Saud, "I want to meet this man. I want to meet Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdullah." So they met. Sheikh Al Islam met him at his house. And after hearing his da'wah, after hearing the da'wah of Tawheed, which is the da'wah of Fitr, if somebody tells you that I want to establish the hukuk of Allah, who's going to say to you, you can't do this, I don't want to say anything else. When Muhammad ibn Saud heard, he listened, of what Shaykh al-Islam said, that this is what I want to do, Muhammad ibn Saud being the leader of al dari he said to him, Khalas, aman wa protection, 
and security is from him. And then he said to Muhammad, I have one condition. I'm going to put a condition down. I will give you security and protection. In return, I want something else. Shah Ali Sahib said, What do you want? Now, what do you want me to do? He said, You can't move from Dar'i, you will stay in this year. Sheikh said, Thank you. He said, After when Allah spreads this da'wah, you will not move from where? From Dar'i, you will stay in Dar'i. Until this day, the masjid of Sheikh Al Islam, Muhammad Abdul Wahab, which is built with gold, is built with gold. It's still built like it was 300 years ago. Mud, there's no carpet, there's nothing. Now they say, Wahhabi has big funding from the British, huh? Go see the Masjid of Shaykhul Islam. Go see the house of Shaykhul Islam, it has been demolished. Simple. Mud. You know the mud huts that you get? Have you seen those houses that are built with clay? You know the old houses, have you seen that? Yeah. That's how the Masjid of Shaykhul Islam is still distinct. In Dar'i, where he used to teach. Simple. So we don't know where these dollars